What is this? This is all yours. This is all Okay, it's 11.31, so I think we can get started. Uh, first of all, on behalf of IUCN and TNC, let me uh, express my warmest appreciation to all of you for uh, coming to today's side event. Um, this side event, uh, as you can see in the title, focuses on the topic of nature-based solutions to climate change, unpacking uh, the potential and pitfalls. And we are also supported in this event by our colleagues from Nature for Climate, IUCN is part, and both TNC are part of Nature for Climate. Uh, so I'd like to acknowledge them as well. Um, I'll start off by trying to set very quickly the scene uh, for where we are on nature-based solutions today, and then we are joined by our distinguished panelists who will help us take a deeper dive on some of the more specific aspects of this topic. Now, um, IUCN, as most of you may be aware, uh, is a union of members. We have 1,500 members uh, from across states, governments, international and national uh, NGOs, and indigenous peoples' organizations. Nature-based solutions is a topic that IUCN has been working on for an awfully long time. I think since we, uh, together with the World Bank, coined the term back in 2009. And in 2016, our members um, at the IUCN World Conservation Congress in Hawaii first adopted a definition for nature-based solutions. And at the Congress in, in Marseille last year, also adopted a global standard for nature-based solutions. And indeed, what we have seen over the last few years has been a real uh, recognition, growing recognition of this term worldwide. So for example, if you think about the 2019 UN Climate Action Summit that was convened by the UN Secretary General, that had a dedicated track on nature-based solutions that was co-led by uh, China and New Zealand, and which delivered a nature-based solutions for climate manifesto. And that process, of course, was also supported by, by UNIP and several uh, others in that process. And in 2020, in the UN and New York, again, you had the leaders pledge for nature, which also recognized nature-based solutions. In 2021, last year, we also saw, that, saw it being recognized both in the G7 as well as in the G20 ministerial communiques came out, uh, that came out last year. And, and indeed, uh, also in Glasgow, there was a widespread recognition of the role that nature could play in, in delivering the goals of the Paris Agreement and indeed in addressing the interlinked challenges of climate change and biodiversity loss which is now as well uh, being very, very firmly recognized. Uh, of course, um, there is a lot of work still to be done in this uh, space. Concerns have also been raised by some on the potential misuse of the term. Um, there are questions around accounting of nature-based solutions, around the potential risks and challenges of offsetting and several others. So the, so the purpose of our session today was essentially to try and, and, and unpack some of these issues, you know, both the potential, also understanding the benefits, and indeed some of the pitfalls that we as a community need to navigate through and, and come up with solutions for. So 
that's just by way of setting the scene. Um, as I said, we are joined uh, by a very distinguished um, set of panelists today, and let me quickly introduce them before then moving on um, to, to the speakers. So we have our first speaker, Barney Dixon, joining us from UNEP. He is a senior program officer in the Nature for Climate branch uh, of UNEP. Previously, he was a co-director of the Global Commission on Adaptation at the Global Center on Adaptation. Currently, much of Barney's work is focused on nature-based solutions for climate change mitigation and adaptation, including through uh, ecosystem restoration. Next, we have uh, Deva Priya Roy, uh, who joins us from the implementation unit of the Climate Finance Subdivision of the UNFCCC Secretariat, where she is the secretary to the UNFCCC Standing Committee on Finance and has been leading the preparations for the committee's forum on nature-based solutions financing. She is also responsible for providing strategic support to the intergovernmental negotiations on climate finance. Then on my left, um, we have uh, Virginia Young, who is from the Australian Rainforest Conservation Society, where she contributes to an international research project on primary forests led by Griffith University. Her work is focused on the nexus between biodiversity and climate change and its relevance to international policy arenas, including the UNFCCC, the CBD, and the SDGs. She is also a past president of the Australian Committee of IUCN and a member of the World Commission on Protected Areas, a specialist group on climate change. Uh, and then, of course, it's my great pleasure to uh, introduce Danielle Morsha, uh, who is the Global Director for Climate Adaptation at the Nature Conservancy, which is also an IUCN um, international NGO member. Prior to TNC, um, he's a Venezuelan native with origins also in France. Uh, he was a senior adaptation advisor at IISD, and before that, uh, um, a senior adaptation and resilient advisor at Oxfam uh, UK. Um, and we're delighted that you know, we are collaborating with TNC on this event. We have our final speaker today who will be joining us at 12. Um, she is uh, Valeria uh, Cuevas, who is the head of department for climate change in the Ministry of Foreign Affairs in Mexico. Uh, she's caught up in the negotiations, but she should be joining us shortly. So those are the introductions. We'll, we'll, we'll follow the presentations in the order that I just mentioned. Um, and I'm going to um, you know, moderate the panel in a, in, in a way that we keep on time. So all the speakers have been asked to limit their interventions to no more than eight minutes, and I have my colleague Alice here who will be showing the one-minute mark uh, once we get to the end of your time limit, so that we try and have at least half an hour in the end uh, for a Q&A and, and a rich discussion. So without any further ado, over to you, Bani. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, do I need to, yeah. Yeah, I hope I'm going to almost lean across you. <laughs> Um, thank you very much, Sandeep. Uh, congratulations to IUCN and, and TNC for, for hosting this meeting. And I think that the, the title in terms of looking at uh, both potential and pitfalls is, is, is a very relevant one. And I'll make a couple of remarks, particularly about the importance of paying attention to pitfalls at the end. What I want to try and do within my eight minutes, and please, yes, wave that piece of paper at me. Um, I, uh, there is a risk I'll try to overrun. Um, I want to talk about just two topics. One is the resolution on nature-based solutions that was passed at the UN Environment Assembly in March, including a definition of uh, uh, nature-based solutions. And the second is um, slightly more specific uh, 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 about some work, joint work which IUCN and UNEP published uh, uh, for COP26 on um, essentially the size and nature of the contribution that nature-based solutions can make to climate change mitigation. I'll start with the resolution, um, and I'm just going to kind of summarize the main features of the resolution here. Uh, First point, most important point, there is now, for the first time in that resolution, a multilaterally agreed definition of nature-based solutions. I think we should uh, refer to this as not as the UNEA, or UN Environment Assembly definition, certainly not the UNEP definition, 
but as the UN definition of nature-based solutions. UNEP is a, uh, a, a UN entity with universal membership, so every UN member state is, is a member of um, uh, 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 UNEP. Uh, and in later this year, we fully expect that the report from UN Environment Assembly will be confirmed, uh, adopted by the um, UN General Assembly in September. Um, this is important, as some of you may know, because some countries in the past have uh, objected to references to NBS by UN entities in UN processes. Uh, 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 and this resolution, we believe, removes this obstacle. Uh, but as anybody who's been listening to the discussions here at this meeting knows, <laughs> we've still got some work to do in to spread the news. And uh, I think I would ask each of you uh, to take the opportunity to politely uh, uh, indicate to those who suggest we don't have a definition of MBS, that that is, or a multilaterally agreed definition, then that is no longer the case. Um, and the rest of the resolution essentially, um, in addition to the definition, provides a broad characterization of nature-based solutions. The definition, I hope you will be pleased to know, follows quite closely the 2016 IUCN definition that uh, Sandeep referenced. Not identical, but the changes are relatively small, and the substance and the structure of that, the, the wording is very, follows the IUCN definition very closely. This is important because the IUCN definition is a good one. Uh, it's been quite widely supported. But what the IUCN definition did not have, and what this UN definition does have, in, is endorsement from the multilateral system. Um, yeah, I missed that point. Uh, also worth noting, because uh, our colleagues who focus very much on the um, uh, uh, CBD, for them this is sometimes an issue, the relationship between the concept of nature-based solutions and the concept of ecosystem-based approaches. This is a term which has been used a lot in the CBD typically refers to ecosystem-based approaches to climate mitigation, adaptation, and DRR, disaster risk reduction. Um, anyway, the, 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 the resolution is quite explicit that these concepts are in harmony with each other, uh, and we hope uh, that that uh, helps diffuse any potential tension uh, between the uh, two concepts or, or need to sort of assert that one is sort of prior or more important than the other. Uh, the resolution also stresses that NB puts NBS very firmly in the context of the Sustainable Development Goals and the 2030 Agenda, and that I think is uh, politically important. It's also clear that social and environmental safeguards are critical to the implementation of nature-based solutions, including safeguards for indigenous peoples and local communities. Uh, this is sort of broadly important because safeguards are one tool, not the only tool, but one tool for addressing some of the concerns which some constituencies have about um, nature-based solutions. Finally, what the resolution actually calls for, it requests UNEP to convene an intergovernmental consultation process focused on basically three things, compiling examples of good practice, assessing existing and potential criteria, standards and guidelines, and thirdly, identifying sources of finance for developing countries to implement MBS. Uh, we in UNEP are in the early stages of designing this uh, consultation process, which we would hope to run and complete by the end of 2023. Um, and we think it provides an excellent opportunity to build awareness and consensus and a common understanding around nature-based solutions. That's the resolution. Second point, I'm probably running out of time already. A few words about nature-based solutions and climate mitigation. 
Uh, I'm referring to the, I've, I've, I'll wave a copy around in the air. I have a couple of spare copies, so if you're uh, very nice or just ask me <laughs> early, <laughs> I'll give you a copy. Um, uh, called Nature-Based Solutions for Climate, Miti Climate Change Mitigation. This publication assesses the scientific literature on the size and nature of the potential contribution of MBS to mitigation. It suggests that a cautious interpretation of, um, uh, of the size of that contribution is appropriate. So it tends to favor the lower estimates in the, uh, that exist in the literature. We think that's appropriate because of the real world complexities of delivering this in, a ways, in ways that respect safeguards and ensure the environmental integrity of the contribution coming from MBS. So we're talking about uh, uh, five gigatons CO2 equivalent per year by 2030, and a potential of up to of, of 10 um, uh, gigatons of, uh, uh, of CO2 equivalent per year by 2050. And although that is smaller than some of the estimates I referred to, I've got one minute left, I would emphasize that if we, if we were able to deliver five gigatons per year by 2030 and, and increase by 2050, that would be a very significant contribution to climate mitigation. Um, and it also makes the discusses the potential uh, of, of using private sector offsets to finance this, gives the results of an IUCN survey of its members, 569 members responded to that survey. And surprisingly to, to some of us, including me, those, the results of that survey, basically significant majorities were in favor of, um, of IUCN members of uh, such offsets when, when, when done appropriately with the appropriate um, uh, 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 conditionalities and, and, and safeguards. Final remark, two points. Um, I think for those of us who believe in the potential value of nature-based solutions, which I assume is many in this room, uh, we, now, we are now in a phase when we need to make, move beyond making the general positive case for nature-based solutions, explaining how wonderful it is, uh, you know, how it can deliver multiple benefits and so on. We, we, we can continue to do that, and that, that's important, but we're now in an opportunity, you know, we're in a sort of political situation which is both more challenging, but there is an opportunity. There is now increased support for linking nature and climate agendas. And is important final point, an important part of making this shift is that we have to listen carefully and respectfully to those who have concerns about nature-based solutions and doing so not in a you know, cynical spirit of political calculation, but because they may actually have something to teach us. Uh, there are possible pitfalls to nature-based solutions and we need to be aware of them and to address them if we wish to nature-based solutions to play the significant role it can do in addressing a range of, cli of climate and other societal challenges. Thank you very much. Almost eight minutes. Great. Thank you, Bani, for already unpacking several of the issues that I think we may want to revisit in the Q&A. But now it's my great pleasure to uh, hand over the floor to Deba Priyaroy Debroy to talk about one of the elements that Bani already raised, finance. Over to you, Deb. Thank you, Sandeep. Uh, thanks to the IUCN and TNC for inviting the UNF Secretariat um, to present um, some of the outcomes of the SCF Forum on Nature-Based Solutions. Um, I have a few slides, and while they are being put up, um, for those who don't uh, know the SCF, uh, the Standing Committee on Finance is a climate finance expert body under the COP. One of the important reasons that the COP established the SCF was to improve coherence and coordination in the delivery of climate finance. The forum is a dedicated space for 
um, achieving that goal. Through the forum, the SCF facilitates technical discussions among key climate finance practitioners, the private sector, parties, operating entities, um, academia, and representatives of civil society on ways to accelerate mobilization and delivery of climate finance. The outcomes of the forum are reported to the COP in the form of high-level summaries and uh, policy recommendations. So the forum is, is that UN platform where everyone has an equal footing um, in discussing practical solutions, practical ways um, to, to bring um, finance closer to the implementation. Um, and it is essentially a bridge between the practitioners and the decision makers at the COP. So the SCF in the past has organized, um, right, I, I can move the slides, yeah. The SCF has organized forums on um, a number of topics, uh, including climate uh, financing adaptation, loss and damage, climate resilient infrastructure, um, and um, the reason why the SCF uh, chose uh, nature-based solutions back in 2019, um, I, I need not uh, go into the details, but there was a growing recognition on the potential of NBS for addressing climate change. Um, and um, there was a bottom-up uh, recognition of that through the NDCs. Um, there was um, scope for coherence between the Rio conventions on this topic, um, and then uh, the UNSG Climate Action Summit that Sandeep mentioned. Um, the SEF decided to host uh, the forum in two parts because of COVID. We had one part, which was a hybrid event last year in October, held at the UN campus. Um, and there will be the second part, which uh, we will organize this year. So um, let me just go a little bit into the outcomes of uh, the first part. Um, at the outset, the SCF invited um, uh, submissions from its stakeholders, and this was a rich variety of um, uh, submissions. We received inputs, um, which sort of facilitated an understanding on um, NBS, a lot of discussion on definitions, what is NBS, what are the safeguards, and certainly it's very helpful at this point to have the outcomes of UNEA, um, and uh, nice to hear Barney's uh, presentation. We've also collaborated uh, in our working session sessions, also with Sandeep in the past. Um, and um, I must say that um, one of the key topics was, of course, um, uh, what is NBS and how can we um, implement this on the ground? Um, and the next step is moving beyond the importance of NBS and really looking at how to finance the projects on the ground. Uh, so some of the key outcomes, NBS can holistically address development climate priorities and that finance for NBS must be scaled up. Um, and how is this to be done to, um, by, by understanding how nature can be reflected in the true cost of goods and services? Um, in terms of catalyzing nature-based solutions in developing countries, there are some key needs to be addressed incorporating NBS into policies and strategies at all levels, enhancing the institutional, organizational, and individual capacities to integrate NBS, strengthening the enabling environment. Debt support was mentioned in a way to create more fiscal space for the transition to a climate and nature positive economic system. Um, it was also mentioned that um, economic instruments, existing instruments such as debt for nature swaps, um, uh, should be scaled up, especially in the context of COVID-19. Um, and most importantly, a recognition of the local land rights, traditional indigenous knowledge when designing and implementing nature-based solutions. So there was a broad recognition that bottom-up approaches can systematically support local livelihoods and protect and preserve nature. Now, in order to leverage and mobilize scaled-up finance, there are actions required. And this would be in the area of strengthening the investment case for such solutions. And this can be done by improving communication of information and data to encourage stakeholders and project developers to evaluate the benefits of such investments. This also requires increased efforts of governments to account for nature in their budgetary systems. Increasing private sector disclosure for nature-related financial risks is another important aspect. And largely, to effectively leverage finance from the private sector, there is a need for having tools that de-risk investments for the private sector. Um, another important aspect, now when we talk about uh, finance uh, for any topic, uh, this is not exclusive to nature-based solutions. Um, there are 
always concerns um, around accessing finance, and especially for developing countries, what are the hindrances, what are the challenges they face? So firstly, complex requirements um, of, um, there, there is funding out there, but the requirements are too complex to navigate. Um, lack of capacity thereof for recipient countries to access this finance, to meet the eligibility criteria, and to meet the monitoring and reporting requirements. Insufficient access uh, to adequate and reliable data that also helps in designing robust projects um, uh, for nature-based solutions. Last but not least, lack of inclusive financing. This refers to fair and competitive lines of credits for local actors. Um, and this includes also the cohort of um, indigenous peoples, gender, and um, uh, youth-based um, actors. Um, some of the recommendations of uh, the first part, um, forum participants recommend, recommended a number of action points. There was a call for increased commitments and disbursements of international finance for nature-based solutions, especially for developing countries. Um, I mentioned enhancing enabling environments that unlock private investment, identify ways to expand opportunities for investments in such solutions, and better and fair access uh, to finance, and also looking into developing more innovative financial instruments. Urging the private sector to disclose nature-related financial risks is uh, a big way forward. Um, and largely uh, balancing the short-term policies, such as the five-year plans of governments, with the long-term climate and nature targets uh, such as uh, those we see in the net zero pledges for 2050. So there has to be a balance in these policies because nature targets tend to be more long-term by both public and private sector actors. Coming to my last slide, um, the forum objectives for this year. Now, having discussed um, uh, the sort of the concept, the science, um, the needs, priorities uh, around nature-based solutions and having the UNEA outcomes um, and having a whole uh, range of stakeholders already um, working with the SCF on, on this topic. Um, the second part of the forum would be really focused on scaled up implementation, what is needed around that, how to mobilize financial resources from all sources, public and private, uh, domestic, international, regional, and essentially how to make sure that uh, countries, developing countries can access that. So some of the things that the forum, which uh, is uh, currently being designed with the two co-facilitators, um, we are going to be looking at concrete examples and learning opportunities for scaling up finance. We're going to be looking at case studies on um, carbon-rich ecosystems that can um, synergize adaptation, mitigation, and resilience, specific challenges that countries face in accessing financing, um, looking at specific financial mechanisms and instruments, um, what are the innovative ways, what are the well-established ways, and how to scale them up, and essentially creating the enabling environments for driving private in investments. Um, and last but not least, what would be the policy recommendations within the UNFCCC financial mechanism, which includes its operating entities and other funds, and going beyond to address the financial landscape, including the public and private uh, financial sectors. Um, the second part of the forum uh, like I mentioned, is being led by two co-facilitators of uh, the SCF. Uh, there's Ambassador Mohammed Nasser from Egypt and Ms. Fiona Gilbert from Australia, and they would be presenting the latest uh, plan at the upcoming SCF meeting from 17 to 18 June, so right after the sessions. Um, and we hope to uh, present uh, the program outline, and soon after they would be reaching out uh, to resource persons and discussing more with the, um, the relevant stakeholders who are already engaged with them on this work on taking this forward. I'll stop here and thank you very much, Sandeep, once again for the invitation. Thank you so much, Deb, for that uh, really informative presentation. And, and as we all know, you know, and it's, it's come up again and again, nature-based solutions, some estimate can provide around 30% of the solution that's required, but yet receive only 3% of climate financing today. So that's clearly an important gap that needs to be fulfilled. So without any further ado, let me now invite Virginia Young to make her presentation and also talk about some of the pitfalls. And I probably need someone else to... Um... Yeah, I think Danielle is going to help on that. Oh, so you'll just need to... Call out oh, when you need working. the Very good. slides to transition. Okay, I've only got a few slides anyway. And it, um, as it happens, it's actually consistent with um, 
a couple of the needs that the previous speakers have opened up. Um, Many of you will be aware, I assume, of the first ever joint workshop between IPBES and the IPCC in June last year. And that was critically important in my view, and it would actually be helpful if it got followed up some way through a joint um, work program or a joint special report between IPBES and the IPCC. Uh, but the conclusion that biodiversity loss and climate change are driven um, by human economic activities and mutually reinforce each other might not surprise most people in this room, but I think it's something that a lot of climate negotiators still have very little awareness of, as is the fact that neither crisis will be successfully resolved unless both are tackled together. And that's where um, uh, some of the challenges come in for climate policy makers, and they've been alluded to, but there has been very weak recognition in the UNFCCC of the value and functional role of biodiversity in maintaining ecosystem integrity. Why is that important? Ecosystems in high integrity are more stable, have more resilience, and they store carbon more safely for longer. So they're a lower risk, um, and if you're thinking now about the, you know, increasing action in land, forests and ecosystems, risk is a critical consideration and maintaining or restoring the integrity of ecosystems becomes a fundamentally important criteria for judging your mitigation effectiveness, adaptation effectiveness and even the effectiveness for ongoing sustainable development. Um, so that's, you know, part of the challenge in this... In this oh, please change the slide. <laughs> I'm sorry, I'm not telling you when to change slides. Yeah. <laughs> so, you know, we've, we've got many different estimates of the potential of nature-based solutions um, to contribute to climate change. Gris Griscom et al. were the first to identify up to 37% um, of the solution. It's interesting in IPCC Working Group um, 3, Chapter 7, they actually identify protection of natural ecosystems as having the highest mitigation total value and mitigation density. That's a remarkable um, statement from the IPCC. And they identify um, the total mitigation potential as an, an average of 7.9 gigatons of CO2 equivalent. So that's quite a high estimate, but down as low, I think, as 1.9. So there's a range of, in their assessment. So we've, we've already talked about the, the critical role that having a, a robust definition, um, guidance, and now, really importantly, I agree, having the UNEA, a multilateral definition, you know, agreed um, on, on um, nature-based solutions, and that will go some way to avoiding the pitfalls. But there's actually a really um, other crucial gap, and that is that because um, the evolution of thinking about land and forests in the UNFCCC has been very much production-oriented, um, uh, focused on netting out within the sector, it has, uh, uh, and the failure to understand the importance of biodiversity for longevity and stability of carbon storage, instead focusing on annual fluxes, um, there's a critical gap in the information base to inform decision-making on climate action in land and forest. And that information gap um, has very conveniently potentially... ..has the potential to be filled by another UN um, recent development, and that's a new ecosystem accounting framework that's been developed by the UN Statistical Division. And that was released in March last year. Now, why is this important? Well, um, it's got all sorts of elements that are missing from the current thinking on land and forest accounting in the UNFCCC. So, crucially, it accounts for stocks and not just flow and the condition of those, the ecosystems in which those stocks are held. Um, all land and associated ecosystems are spatially referenced, so it's comprehensive. Um, uh, it can disaggregate stocks into different categories, ref reflects the quality or condition against a natural reference level, which is an ecologically defined reference level. 
There's a much more detailed presentation I could give you all on the joys of this accounting system, but and and I am um, um, having some bilateral com conversations with parties, and I am interested in talking to the Australian co-chair um, in relation to some of the financing needs about the relevance of this system. Um, uh, it enables parties to um, account for all you know, above and below ground pools, which is not currently possible under the UNFCCC system, and disaggregates um, gross flows, which enables you to see much more clearly the benefits of management change. Um, so that reference level, as I said, of ecosystem integrity is an ecologically based um, uh, reference level. And the the... You can disaggregate this for carbon stocks or any ecosystem services, um, and be, you're building essentially an asset, an ecosystem asset base into your national accounts. So this isn't designed for the purpose of carbon trading or, or for carbon accounting for climate mitigation. It's designed to show um, state parties the benefits of their natural assets and how that's related to the condition of those assets. And then there's an economic valuation that is linked to this that enables the economic value to be reflected in the balance sheet of countries' national accounts. So this is a critically important new tool to facilitate integrated climate and biodiversity action and enable state parties to see the benefit of biodiversity and ecosystem integrity for the longevity and resilience of carbon storage. So I'm at my time, am I? So was that one? Well, look, I don't think I need my extra one minute, so I will. <laughs> I will. <laughs> and, um, if anyone's interested in learning more about the, the SEA, again, it has the benefit of being a UN mandated standard and it will become the global standard in people's national accounts. Some 90 countries are already implementing this, the UN SEA. Thank you. <laughs> Great. Thank you so much, uh, Virginia, also for being so succinct in your intervention. And, and now, as I'm sure all of you have noticed, we are really honored to be joined by our colleague from Mexico, Valeria Cuevas. Uh, I hope I'm pronouncing your name correctly. Yeah, <laughs> Who is the head of department for climate change in the Ministry of Foreign Affairs uh, at Mexico. And Mexico, of course, is, uh, we are honored to have Mexico as a state member of IUCN. So, uh, Valeria, I don't know if you're ready to jump straight into your <laughs> presentation or you'd like uh, our colleague from TNC to go first while you get your breath. But maybe what I can just say that we have already in this presentation heard from uh, uh, Barney from UNEP who spoke about the UNIA definition, also about the recent report that UNEP and IUCN released on nature-based solutions for climate mitigation. We heard then also from uh, Deb Roy from the UNFCCC Secretariat on some of the findings and outcomes of the Standing Committee on Finance's annual forum on nature-based solutions financing. And then finally, we heard from Virginia Young, who was talking us through some of the, the important needs for ensuring that accounting on nature-based solutions is done appropriately. And so if you're happy to go uh, straight away, then we'd be delighted to hear about Mexico's national experiences in implementing yeah, sure. uh, nature-based solutions and integrating it into your national policy frameworks. So over uh, to you. Thank, thank you. you very much. And first of all, uh, thank you for inviting us. I'm glad to be here with my other colleagues, and I'm glad to be here with you. Uh, actually, it's supposed to be my boss, uh, who is a uh, deputy director from climate change in Mexico, who be here. But she she wasn't able to attend it unfortunately. But I will try my best to to give you our national context and to to tell you about the the national experiences that we have been implementing in Mexico because uh, we believe that uh, nature based solutions as well as other um, topics are so important to, to face uh, climate change. So I prepare like a couple of uh, bullets and I would like to, to read them and if you have any further question, any comment, it, it will be welcome. 
Um, for Mexico, we believe that our context demands uh, cost-effective measures with immediate co-benefits. And we strongly believe that uh, in need of a cultural transformation and a shift towards circular economy models, uh, we have learned that nature-based solutions with an ecosystem-based approach are the perfect example of successful uh, coordinated actions that translate into real benefits for the environment and communities. Uh, for Mexico, and I also believe that for some parties and all, all over the world, uh, nature-based solutions represent uh, large-scale solutions that create synergies between the three Rio conventions and the SDG agenda, and it enables us to enhance benefits for all people. And I would like to point out, uh, I was reading about this topic yesterday, and I think it was a very interesting data. According to a study carried out in 2020 by the International Institute for Applied System Analysis, yes, I hope to say it well, uh, nature-based solutions such as reforestation, agroforestry, mangroves, and soil restoration can contribute to more than 20% of emission reduction goals of uh, greenhouse uh, go emissions of Mexico for 2050. So I think it's a very important data, and that's why we are so committed to, to keep implementing, to uh, keep enhancing what we're doing until now. Uh, these kind of solutions can help to face environmental, economic, and social cha challenges. And for example, in Mexico, we believe that through the implementation of the sustainable agro silvopastoral systems, we can avoid land degradation while we are promoting also the conservation and restoration of soils and ecosystems, reducing drought of water sources, uh, favoring mitigation through carbon capture and storage, and of course, the enhancement of food security and poverty reduction. Therefore, uh, in Mexico, as a part of our national determined contribution, we establish nature-based solutions as a transversal, a transversal element to the implementation of the national climatic committees, both in the mitigation and adaptation component. And I'm going to give you some examples on how are we are doing this. We have uh, presented like main areas or main activities that we believe it's important to to implement. So first, we have uh, conservation and restoration of blue carbon ecosystems, seas, uh, oceans, forests, and key species. The other is strengthen the management of natural protected areas and increase their connectivity. Also, it's important to strengthen instruments and implement actions for the conservation of biodiversity and the restoration of marine, coastal, and fresh water ecosystems. Uh, for us, it's important to promote hydrological environmental services through the conservation, protection, and restoration of water sheets with special attention to nature-based solutions. And finally, actions intended to strengthen the management and conservation of forests and rainforest. Uh, for our country, it's so essential to protect communities from adverse impacts of climate change, such as extreme hydrometeorological events related to global changes in, in temperature and the increase of the temperature, as well as the resilience, resilience of strategic infrastructure and other ecosystems that uh, host national biodiversity, since we are uh, one of the main uh, countries that have a big amount of biodiversity. It's a very important topic to us. And we have a target of reaching a rate of 0% of deforestation by the year 2030. And we know that we it will be achieved with the equitable participation of the population. We believe that uh, public information, access to information, and, and to have this kind of dynamics is so important so we can hear their voices, their proposals, their needs, so we can uh, ensure that they are uh, taken into account in our national uh, policies, in our national fora. And finally, uh, we recognize the importance of nature-based solutions since they are an important element to promote activities and policies that lead to a green recovery that allows the sustainable and resilient use of natural resources. Uh, and that, that will be uh, like a general image. Uh, I'm <laughs> Great. Thank you so much for such a comprehensive presentation. 
No, I think um, we really acknowledge uh, Mexico's leadership on this topic, and you know, it's it's. It, I think several other countries are also doing a lot of work on this space, and I think they would have all benefited from hearing uh, Mexico's experience. Thank you again. Um, so, without any further ado, I think I'll now turn to the final speaker. Uh, my colleague, Daniel, from TNC, to share some of TNC's work on this topic. Over to you, Daniel. Yeah, thank you, Sandeep. Let me check. Yeah, I think the mic is working. Thanks, everyone. I'll stand up. I don't, I don't have to be in front of a computer, so, so you can see me from the back. And hi to, to the folks also uh, joining virtually. Um, at TNC, we're also, you know, like our colleagues here, doing big efforts to promote nature-based solutions in the context of uh, mitigation and adaptation. And as many of our of, of the panelists mentioned, uh, Victoria mentioned, for example, the potential of nature-based solutions for mitigation. You talk about a 37% um, figure, which is the, one, the same one that I was going to, to present. So the potential is huge. And uh, there's an important way to address this and to reach this potential in a way that is uh, in the right way. And let me, let me get into that later. For adaptation, uh, MBS for adaptation, there's also important and huge benefits and potentials. And that's also, and, and in fact, that's the area that I want to focus on today, uh, adaptation. And there's many avenues, right? There's many areas where benefits can be delivered. And um, let's start with building resilience or disaster risk reduction, coastal resilience, um, you know, regenerative agriculture. These are uh, types of nature-based solutions which we are, we have a repertoire of projects so that we could, uh, you know, that, um, okay, we can probably, you know, get into that in the Q&A or, but there's a, a, what I'm trying to say is there's a lot of evidence. There's a lot of evidence out there of the benefits and also there's a lot of learning that has happened and continues to happen in terms of how to, how to get it right, right? How to, as my colleagues have been discussing here, how to engage stakeholders in a, in a right and meaningful way, how to prioritize, how to recognize the trade-offs and therefore how, you know, what decisions to make in order, you know, in, in recognizing that not planting mangroves full stop is not, is not enough, right? There has to be a lot of analysis behind it, a lot of contribution, participation, so that it is done in a way that is positive. And I know I'm using the word right, I'm using the word positive, and, you know, what does that mean? But it has to be in a way that is, of course, aligned with processes of bottom-up um, and uh, of meaningful participation. I think sometimes, you know, there, there are all these standards, but it's really important on a case-by-case, -case, and I think this is an important lesson for, for practitioners as well as researchers to recognize that on a case-by-case, -case, we must understand the differences in applying um, standards, you know, and or even uh, you know, we, we've been talking here quite a bit about the definition of nature-based solutions. Yes, it is there, it is approved, but I think it's important to engage with the discomfort around it that exists out there, recognize, you know, that there is a lot to learn still and a lot to understand, uh, but not only the, the, the impacts, trade-offs, implications of nature-based solutions, but also of, of adaptation in general, of the work that we do in, in conservation and development. So for me, that discomfort is a lot about, it really talks to the point of, you know, have we really understood in depth the implications of nature-based solutions on a certain, you know, on a, a breadth of dynamics? You know, I'll give you a couple of examples of work that we are doing to, uh, we are, we're just starting uh, to, to understand this better, to understand the social part, the social components of this, uh, this conservation work and the, con and the connection to nature-based solutions. And before go giving you those two examples, let me say that at TNC, we are you know, in line with the idea that it is important to engage with that, let's call it discomfort, with that exploration, I'd rather call it exploration. You know, we're framing our work on adaptation across the spectrum, you know, whether our work is in fisheries, coastal resilience, agriculture, we are uh, welfare management, etc. We are framing it around principles and, uh, and values, right? So climate information, having climate information there as a key part of uh, doing Nature-based solutions, right, is fundamental, and you know you, you may or may not be familiar with what the TNC is doing, but we have a strong science arm, uh, and particularly natural science arm, that provides and produces in collaboration with partners science that helps determine, you know, um, 
helps target and do nature-based solutions right. But that's an element only. And therefore, you know, we are framing, again, adaptation at, as in the work that we're doing, a bunch around a, a, a series of principles that are around social and gender equity, recognizing that social and gender inequity exists out there massively. Therefore, nature-based solution has to directly, and I focus on directly because I think it's too easy to say, you know, we're going to be working on this conservation, and then, you know, there will be trickle-down effects. It's very easy, and not because, uh, the, you know, because people are bad, but just because it's very it's, it's hard, right? It's hard work. It requires a lot of uh, much more exploration to uh, understand what are those... Um, what are the trade-offs and therefore how to address gender inequity when you are designing and implementing nature-based solutions. But it is essential. You know, I, I, uh, I, I think that, so that, that's really an essential part of doing it right. And actually, of not only from a human point of view and a human right point of view and a, and a really a biodiversity conservation objective point of view, but also from a point of politically helping it gain ground. You know, nature and nature, you know, at COP26 and nature-based solutions, in these last few years, it's been gaining ground, but I think you know we are at a moment that politically it also has to be um, further pushed, supported, uh, believed in by a set of uh, stakeholders who are maybe still on the fence. I think we have to. It's important to recognize that, and therefore, you know, really driving nature-based solutions as a vehicle for empowerment of uh, of people, communities, and and for the protection and restoration of nature. Then that's the combination. So you know, we, I talked about. Um, gender, social equity, the principles that are there, you know, I, and I won't go through them all, but, I, you know, um, we're talking here about climate justice, well-being, poverty alleviation in the broadest sense, not just income, but access to resources, education, health. Really, nature-based solutions, I think, have a, an important role to play in facilitating this. But it can, it can or it can probably not do it. And so therefore, it's, um, they, again, you know, it's essential to do the necessaries, do the analysis, do the consultations, establish the partnerships so that the nature-based solutions approach really does do that, really does contribute to poverty alleviation. And so the two examples that I'll mention, and um, really one is just in the pipeline, we haven't really got the funding for this work yet, but we are moving in that direction, is the point I'm trying to make. It's understanding, it's a project around understanding the implications of nature-based solutions on care work. And another one, and uh, it's a, uh, uh, a project in Peru and Chile around understanding how the perspectives of indigenous peoples have or have not managed to influence national adaptation policies. So we're looking at that as part of really then getting to the core and the heart of nature-based solutions in a more meaningful, profound, and, and deeper way. And to me, this uh, just to, to close, the, this really talks about our interpretation as an organization, as individuals of what success in conservation, adaptation, nature-based solutions means. And uh, to us, it's, it, it means that combination, right, of uh, biodiversity gains, biodiversity wins, nature wins, but in, in combination with the people wins, as I tried to briefly explain around the principles. So I'll, um, I'll say that with the time, but I'll stay here, actually, because um, now we have, I think, mm -hmm. Sandeep? Yeah. No, I, I just wondered before you started the Q&A, I wanted to take the opportunity to actually thank you for making such an important and, and powerful intervention and for drawing attention to the need for us to, you know, be considerate of some of these elements as we unpack, you know, not only the potential, but also the pitfall. So I just wanted to thank you and, and I also wanted to take my prerogative and of course, yeah, please join me in thanking Daniel. So otherwise you wouldn't be able to thank yourself, right? <laughs> As a chair, let me also take the prerogative to make one point uh, before opening, um, before we open up for Q&A, because I haven't heard that mentioned before, and it's an important point, you know, and I think from IUCN, and I think certainly from all of us across the board, it's important not to see nature-based solutions as a get-out-of-jail card for solving the climate challenge. So nature-based solutions do play an important role in both uh, mitigation and adaptation and providing a host of other co-benefits, whether for biodiversity, human health, or livelihoods. But they can succeed only in the context of the deeper decarbonization that is needed across all other sectors today to keep the temperature rise limited to 1.5 degrees. So it's not an either-or. Nature-based solutions can't and shouldn't be seen as a substitute for 
deep sustained and rapid emission reductions is called for by science, but they do have an important and critical role to play, and I think it needs to be kept in mind that it's not either or, but added in addition to uh, the deep emissions we need from other sectors. So that was the only point I wanted to make. Over to you, Daniel, to do the Q&A. Thank you, Steve. And, uh, James, did you want to? It's a question. Oh, OK. So let me, <laughs> all right. Um, I don't know if the mic is still working. I think so, yeah. OK, so thank you again very much for your patience in um, you know, listening to, to all of us. But now it's over to you to share your questions, comments around it. Um, and therefore, we establish a conversation. So what we can do is uh, let's take three questions. You can you know, make a question in general or to a specific panelist. Let's take three questions, then hear the feedback, three questions or comments, and then we'll do the same a couple of times, as many times as we, as we can. So yeah, let's, let's, see, let's see the hands. So let's see. Let's go, for, let's go from the back to the front. So are you in the red uh, shirt, then you're here in the front. And and yourself. Hi, I'm Tatiana. I'm from uh, NGO from Brazil, the Institute of Socioeconomic Studies. And I would like to ask Daniel, uh, well, Daniel, you mentioned evidence. And I didn't uh, quite get uh, exactly the evidence part of your, of your presentation. So I would like to ask you uh, to make the evidence evident, <laughs> if it's um, possible with uh, concrete examples of how uh, NBS can help solve the adaptation issues uh, we've been discussing for the last two weeks now. Hello, Lina Rocha from the Institute for Advanced Sustainability Studies. Um, there are or a few of you that mentioned the definition of nature-based solution, and there have been proposals from science and the private sectors on solutions that I personally would consider more technological, but that have been framed as nature-based, such as ocean alkalinization, and how could it be avoided that these are integrated into the, the processes for NBS and into the definition and the narrative? as they do have many co-benefits for nature, but of course also pitfalls. Hi, um, it's James Lloyd from Nature for Climate. Um, first of all, thank the uh, panelists for some really good interventions there and, and the really strong sense of the power of the word and. And I think too often we see things as trade-offs and actually heard some things that we can do in a sense of and. But one of the challenges, I think, is a lot of the climate finance is directed specifically for adaptation or for mitigation or development finance. And a lot of funders don't like it when you're trying to deliver multiple benefits or blending it from different finance strands. So I'd like to know a bit from each of the panelists about where you think the challenges or some of the asks we should be making about the, how we can stack different forms of finance to recognize that this is at the intersection delivering multiple benefits. And often that means bringing from different streams of financing in a way that integrates but works together to enhance rather than kind of against and seeing it as a trade-off. Um, so it'd just be good to know any active steps around blending finance that you're looking at or working on, because I think this is what we're hearing increasingly is a challenge, certainly from a project level when you're talking to people on the ground, where they don't know whether they're taking it down an adaptation route or a mitigation route, and ultimately they want to plant some mangroves or do some work, they, they're, they're, they're less inclined to some of these structural approaches that we've kind of established on the financing. So I'd just be interested about where you see the kind of financing and the challenges going forward on this area. Thank you very much, James, and, and thanks everyone for, for your questions. I'll, I'm happy to get to the one directed at me, uh, but first, uh, let me offer the panel the, the opportunity to respond to the other two questions, which I think, I mean, they're very different, but there's uh, the point around finance, the private sector point that our colleague from uh, uh, right here did. So would anyone from the panel want to volunteer to comment on these two questions or either of one? Yes, Barney. Thanks. Let me just take the... Um uh, uh, the second question uh, about, um, I think, you know, potential abuse of um, uh, um, um, uh, misuse of 
a term like nature-based solutions. Um, I, th I, th I think this is a, ge a genuine risk. It happens with uh, a lot of terms which begin to gain some currency in the political or, or um, uh, um, uh, uh, policy space. But if you know, if so, you know, if it comes to be seen as you know something attractive uh, uh, and, and appealing, there will no doubt be some who will try to use it for their own advantages without sort of genuinely delivering um, um, uh, uh, the, um, um, uh, the you know the benefits and, and, and without being a genuine form of nature-based solutions. I, you know, there's no simple answer to it. I mean, I th you know, IUCN has um, uh, uh, developed its global standard. Uh, um, I'm not sure that the kinds of things you were referring to were, were um, uh, would necessarily meet that standard. Um, I was talking to uh, uh, the ASEAN, the group, the Southeast Asian countries. Their, their group, ASEAN the group is, is is working on guidelines for nature-based solutions within their um, uh, uh, within their region. Um, so I think one has to, you know, be prepared to uh, accept misuses. In a kind of way, it's a compliment to to those who favour nature-based solutions. But you know, one has to be um, 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 tough about this and say not everything that uh, uh, you're claiming to be is necessarily fits the bill. Having said that, there are some genuine fuzzy areas, I think, with nature-based solutions, particularly when it is combined. Nature-based solutions often and that actually can be very useful when they are combined with grey or infrastructural solutions, uh, you know, and how much nature has to be involved for it to be um, a, to count as a nature-based solution is is a, is a question which I don't think the IUCN standard, or certainly not any definition, you know, gives you a clear-cut answer. So there are fuzzy areas, so that we accept. But you know, these are the kind of issues that we need to be prepared to address. I don't, I don't have any simple answers. I'm avoiding the complicated <laughs> question about finance. Yeah, it's a really important question. And I think the piece that's still missing, I mean, it, it would be great if the UNFCCC adopted the, the new ecosystem definition. It would be great if um, they also enabled state parties to utilise the new ecosystem accounting framework. Um, uh, as well, but that still leaves the question of how people pri what they prioritise under nature-based solutions. And the other interesting thing I found in reading Chapter Seven of Working IPCC Working Group Three is they're pointing people now towards that prioritisation. For the first time, they're saying carbon-rich ecosystems are irrecoverable by 2050. They are saying that it's important to protect primary forests and other primary ecosystems. So we need, um, as guidance develops, um, to actually be somewhat more targeted about the priorities that we need to be aiming for. The reality is we can't afford to lose our most stable and resilient ecosystem carbon stocks and we can't afford to lose the biodiversity that's contained in them. We're at a point in our journey on this planet where we have to draw some lines under where we develop and, and not just how we develop. So I think that's a, you know, that will be a significant challenge moving forward, but it's something we need to work out how to do. Thank you very much, uh, Victoria and uh, Virginia, sorry. And um, okay, so that was mostly for the question for the colleague from Advanced Sustainability Studies. And uh, I wonder if uh, there's someone respond, wanting to respond to James's. I'll certainly uh, um, like to respond on the financial question. It's something I've been giving some thought to in relation to the um, UNC because it does bring the assets and the condition of those ecosystem assets onto a, comp you know, onto a country, into a country's national accounts, which should actually make it easier to fund protection and restoration because you can see the recovery potential because your baseline is the natural baseline. So you can see, for instance, in your forests how far you are below that natural baseline and therefore the benefit of allowing 
you know, say some of your secondary natural forests to recover to, to old forests. Um, and the same with any ecosystem. So it's a, it brings a new level of information um, to countries, uh, to, not just to uh, the countries themselves, but also to investors, to see where the best potential lies um, uh, for ma either maintaining ecosystem carbon stocks in good condition and recovering them. So I'm not quite sure how that would, you know, resolve into um, particular financial instruments, but it's, it's, um, it's got to have significant potential. Deb, do you want to add a few words? Thanks. I was also trying to avoid the finance question. <laughs> <laughs> Come on, you're from the SCF. <laughs> No, I think, um, well, the SCF and the UNFCCC um, um, is not doing its own work on nature-based solutions, um, and the forum is um, one of the ways of bringing um, the concerns of parties and the interest of parties, as we see in the NDCs, to um, implement um, NBS and, you know, use this as an and solution uh, that Sandeep helpfully um, clarified. It's not instead of deep decarbonization deep decarbonization pathways, but in addition to NOA to complement. But I think perhaps just one thing that I would like to um, underline here in terms of finance, um, you know, the convention um, uh, um, states that climate finance has to be in addition to um, development assistance. It has to be new, it has to be predictable, it has to be in addition. So the same concept applies to climate finance for nature-based solutions. Um, one of the biggest concerns um, uh, of the in Glasgow, which came out in the Glasgow Pact, was that the climate finance pledge was not met, and that um, finance for mitigation continues to be um, um, much higher than adaptation finance. And over time, the adaptation and resilience finance needs have uh, only gone up. And we also find that countries are unable to um, appropriately cost those needs around um, adaptation, resilience building. And I think this goes into also nature-based solutions, because again, those um, uh, solutions require more holistic approach which the countries may not have the capacity to cost for. Um, so it's, um, yeah, it's not a simple answer, but I think uh, uh, um, one of the concerns of one group of parties would be that climate finance in any form for, you know, even if it's for nature-based solutions, should not uh, uh, be instead of um, development assistance. Thanks. Thank you very much. And I think, you know, we, uh, it's certainly, this is the kind of space among many others, to not avoid this kind of question. So I think, thanks for not avoiding it. And in fact, <coughs> that's why our session is around benefits and pitfalls. We want to exp <coughs> explore that as well. So thanks for the questions and let's, let's go deep into that. There's so much to explore. And to me, that, that talks to the point. You mentioned, James, it's an and. But yes, there are trade-offs often, very often. So let's not ignore that. We can't because it's, uh, it has impacts on people and nature. And so I'll come uh, to your point, and thanks very much for giving me a few, a couple of minutes. I'll give you three, I'll give you all three examples very briefly, for the sake of time, of uh, work that we're doing on nature-based solutions for adaptation. First one, we have a project called Nature Protects People. It is in collaboration with uh, the IFRC. And uh, our partnership with this kind of humanitarian and development organizations for us is key in the in advancing, you know, not only from a conservation, a strictly conservation point of view, but also like linking to development goals. So there, this is a project around coastal resilience in Indonesia, Micronesia. Um, and uh, one of the things we're doing there is a lot about capacity strengthening, including eco disaster risk reduction activities in local planning of these uh, 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 coastal communities. So that's one example of work that we're, that we're doing. And here, you know, we have a, a menu of things that go from mangrove planting um, and, and more. The second one I wanted to mention briefly is a work we have done on insurance. This is a, an innovative area of work we have uh, focused on in insurance of natural assets. An example in the state of Quintana Roo in Mexico. <laughs> we have, a, um, with the collaboration of a government and other stakeholders, set up a, an insurance policy a parametric insurance policy that when there is a strong wind, it recorded 
a payment is triggered that leads to you know and, and the money that is that comes out of the payment there are brigades that the you know this initiative has trained that um, you know go out to repair and restore coral reefs to uh, you know how can I say like um, clean up and uh, secure uh, sand dunes and so on and therefore promoting um, you know the continuity and the stability of the tourism industry which is an important part of employer and of course also the natural assets themselves reducing the potential impact a future impact of uh, storm surges and also benefiting uh, fisher folk communities but but we have a lot of work there to do to to make that direct link that i talked about between nature-based solutions and local communities and we we're looking at this in the in the face and fi fi finding the ways to do this better in the future, better in the sense of better connected to the needs of communities. And the third and final, Cape Town, South Africa, removal of invasive species that are uh, in, the, in, the, um, in the mountains just outside of Cape Town that are sucking too much water, uh, too much groundwater, and contributing actually to the uh, big drought risk and drought situation of that part of the country. So these are three examples. I hope they give you a little bit of a picture. But um, yeah, I'll stop there. Move to the next uh, three questions from you. And by the way, feel free to ask the questions also in Spanish, in French, maybe even in German. We can try our best. Uh, Spanish, you can speak very fluently. The other languages, maybe a little bit more slowly. Over to you. Three more questions, please, or comments. OK, there's one in the very back. Wait, let's start there. Good afternoon, colleagues. I'm a representative from the UNDP of Ukraine, and we are currently considering the using of the nature-based solutions for the post-conflict reconstruction and uh, affording people who struggle from the Russian aggression to meet their food security needs, uh, to re recover nature from the conflict and the war-related uh, spills and damages and also for the future food security and shelter security. Uh, would you please recommend us uh, the baseline to start from, uh, examples of using nature-based solutions for humanitarian and post-conflict recovery? Thank you. Thank you very much, and uh, let me uh, first uh, express uh, strong solidarity to you and your country. Um, thank you very much for for sharing that point, and uh, I think it's tremendously important and something to really dig deep into. Um, so, let, is there any other question first from the floor before we move? Yes, there's another one here. While our panelists start uh, putting their their ideas to flow. Thank you very much for the very interesting panel. Um, I was wondering. Um, I'm I'm Aya Delayan. I'm from the Philippines, working on um, following a bunch of issues, including nature-based solutions. Um, I was wondering if there uh, if there's a sense of um, how the uh, how do you say it? how countries are feeling about accepting this definition at the multilateral level um, because you've mentioned that and, and I think many of us know that there has been some pushback for various reasons in various forums and um, what is it looking like in terms of uh, how the how the reaction will be or the response will be at the UNGA, for example. Thank you. Thank you very much. That's a great question as well. Unless there's another hand, um, we'll, we'll take those two questions for now. And uh, yeah, I'll, let me take the easy road and first uh, turn it over to you. I wonder if, uh, you know, on the first question around nature-based solutions for post-conflict reconstruction, in addition to it, its other benefits, any any thoughts on that? And second, uh, the point raised by our colleague from the Philippines around, you know, what is the discomfort around the definition around nature-based solutions? What and what is being done? Thought about that? Would anyone want to take this? Sandeep. Thanks, Danny. I'll, I'll make an attempt at the first, uh, and maybe you know, probably Barney will want to come in on the second. Um, so first of all, I mean it's it's a it's a, it's a you know obviously it's a it's a very difficult situation right now and and if one thinks of 
you know, analogies in other areas where that may be applicable um, in, in sort of a post-conflict recovery case or a post-disaster recovery case. Uh, I think there's one sort of prior point to keep in mind, and I think Daniel mentioned this in his previous intervention, that every case is context-specific. So, you know, the context of a particular country at a particular point in time needs to determine, you know, what is the appropriate role that nature-based solutions can play in providing a solution to a particular challenge. So maybe just to share uh, one example that I'm familiar, I mean, it's, it's over 20 years back, but um, or almost 20 years back. This is in relation to the Indian Ocean tsunami um, back in 2005. And there again, we found that as part of you know, that ravaged um, Southeast Asia and South Asia, and I was directly involved in Sri Lanka when it happened at the time. And we found the linkages between nature and, and post-disaster recovery play out in multiple ways. One is, of course, the role that intact and healthy ecosystems itself played, uh, coastal ecosystems, be it mangroves or sand dunes, itself played in minimizing the impact of the disaster. But also in the post-recovery phase, where we found that, you know, if it came to constructing reconstruction, you know, how could that be done in a manner that created, you know, least uh, impacts on on ecosystems, but indeed could benefit from ecosystems and while rebuilding societies. Um, and there may be other examples as well. I'm sure this is not maybe the, the best example, but it's the one that I could think of for now. But certainly I think the big point to keep in mind is that uh, ecosystems and healthy ecosystems underpin um, not only our economies, but also our societies more generally. So as countries and societies invest in their ecosystems, the multiplier benefits of that uh, should hopefully uh, assist um, down the line in, in, in facing some of these challenges. Thank you. Um, yeah, a comment from a slightly different perspective, but also a disaster response in Australia to the catastrophic 2019-20 fires that um, uh, burned over five and a half million hectares of our forests and other lands and killed three billion, killed or displaced three billion um, of our wildlife. Um, what we've found is that the recovery is very much dependent on where we had cause of relatively undisturbed natural systems. And we've we're really building from there. So we're re-establishing connectivity and ecological processes across landscapes based around those core areas that were either undisturbed by the fire or lightly disturbed. And um, um, almost, um, almost all of those areas were in fact older natural systems that had previously been less less disturbed by um, sort of industrial development. What you do in a war zone, though, you may well have lost a lot of those um, relatively natural areas. I, I don't know. I really feel for you. It's a tremendously difficult challenge you'll face at, at every level. But having that goal of restoring ecological function across your landscape and setting... Um, your benchmarks perhaps not just by, or your baselines not just perhaps on what was there but what would deliver a more resilient long-term outcome might be a good thing to consider. All right. uh, is there any comment? Barney, uh, yes, go ahead. So can I just... Uh, oh, yes, sorry. Send sorry, I just, while one of my colleagues helpfully pointed out to me that, you know, there's also some work that is being done um, under the Friends of Ecosystem-Based uh, Adaptation Alliance that is looking at precisely the contribution that nature-based solutions can play in a humanitarian context. So, you know, that's one source of information. And I understand that uh, WWF and IFRC have also recently released a new report that looks at the role of nature-based solutions in, in, in humanitarian uh, relief. So I'd uh, suggest those two additional sources as well. Thank you. Funny. OK, thank you. Um, I'll uh, tackle the, the, the second question. The colleague, I think, from the Philippines raised that. I, I think this is a really important issue. Um, the, 
the question was, I think, you know, what, what are the specific concerns from developing countries from the global south, if you like, uh, ab about NBS? First point I'd make is that um, in some ways this is surprising, um, but that's just my initial observation, because in fact a lot of work, and in, in, we've he heard from Mexico, but you know we could have heard from a number of other countries uh, from different parts of, of, of the global south about the work they've done on nature-based solutions and, and how it how it has, um, you know, they've seen nature-based solutions as an important way to tackle whether climate or other societal challenges uh, in, in, a, in a way that involves working with rather than against uh, uh, nature. But nevertheless, I think, you know, what the, the sentiments that you referred to, I don't. So they're not universal in, amongst developing countries. Uh, they're not even, un, you know, universal within any any individual country. But they are there. Um, I would. One observation is that I think they are often tend to be tick. The, the the issue which seems to um, uh, uh, raise most concerns often relates to. Um, uh, the use of nature-based solutions for climate mitigation. I think there, part of the concern is, at least as I understand it, is this sense that developed countries are, by promoting nature-based solutions for mitigation, are seeking to pass the burden to um, uh, developing countries and, and doing it by saying, well, you know, you should be doing more um, uh, 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 making more use of nature-based solutions for mitigation. I think uh, um, um, proponents, and, and in, in a sense, um, using it, develop, developed countries are using this to avoid having to fulfill their um, uh, 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 proper commitments on, on decarbonisation. Um, you know, I think those of us who support nature-based solutions should be absolutely clear. This should not, you know, in no way should, you know, develop, developed countries should be absolutely criticised if they are appearing to do this or giving the impression that they're trying to shift the burden. As has been, as Sandeep said, you know, not only are nature-based solutions only part of the mitigation solution, and a, and a small part, the, the most important part has to come from not just deep but rapid decarbonisation across the world, but you know, primarily and most obviously in terms of responsibility of having initially caused the problem within developed countries. We have to be absolutely clear about that, proponents of nature-based solutions, to, to address that uh, 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 concern. Um, just very briefly, I don't want to go on for too long, there is another set of concerns, which is often coming from representatives of indigenous peoples and local communities, that indeed, again, particularly focusing on the sort of carbon issue, on the mitigation issue, that this is a way of um, uh, disempowering, taking control of uh, uh, natural resources and using them to solve a problem caused primarily in, by developed countries. Uh, and again, this is where issues around the various different ways, including you know, rigorous and properly enforced safeguards, social and environmental safeguards are important to ensure that nature-based solutions are not, to go back to the earlier question, misused in that way to disempower, to infringe uh, human rights, to yeah, undertake any number of uh, 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 unattractive, unacceptable uh, practices. So I think we have to be, you know, th those of us who think that nature-based solutions um, um, uh, are, are important have to be alive to these concerns, to address them directly, to show how we can address them uh, in practice uh, 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 and, and continue to listen to concerns that may have. I, I think it would be very unfortunate if we ended up in a, in a five years time where MBS is seen as a kind of northern thing. I mean, over. Thanks very much, Barney and colleagues. And I, I think that, yeah, I think that would be unfortunate for sure. So it's, uh, 
therefore moving forward but moving forward with all the concerns that Barney raised our colleagues raised and uh, likewise in the, in the sense of adaptation also you know I think there's a risk or a fear of uh, removing stewardship practices that are there you know that are there and have been there from ancestor from in, indigenous people's practice local communities and and there's a risk of that, and, and that's a risk that, the risk that needs to be avoided for sure. Because there's also evidence that that is uh, that that offers, you know, in a nutshell, you know, advantages in, in the creation of, of resilience. So, so there's all of those elements. Um, I think partnership. To me, the question in addressing this question for me is also about the partnerships that, you know, UN agencies, conservation organizations, NGOs offer, and uh, you know, who are we equally teaming up with? Who, are, who has a space to uh, answer and to not only answer, but to be part of the decisions that are made, the priorities that are made, and so on. So partnership, long-term, genuine, equal partnership is important. And to our colleague from UNDP in Ukraine, also great to see all this uh, opportunity, uh, you know, all this uh, experience that exists there. But I think it also offers an important uh, situation, you know, uh, an important moment for exploring what this might look like and then really, uh, you know, Finding nature-based solutions, using nature-based solutions to address these situations, uh, like the situation of a re post-conflict reconstruction as well. Recognizing that you know part of that then really has to go deep into the cultural and uh, social understanding of the situation of the you know the, the new situation, if I can say that. Thanks for your questions very much. Thanks for your participation. We have a few minutes. We have like uh, five minutes to go. Um, I do have a, a, a question for like a final reflection for our panelists, but I will take that only if there is no questions from you, because we've been speaking a lot in this side of the room. So if there's any, any one final one or two questions, we'll take them. Otherwise, well, in the... Okay, so here's, here is the question, which will require... It's a, perhaps a, a longer question, but... Let's keep it uh, as short as possible. So many of you in the introduction referred to, and, and I think particularly, uh, this is a quote from you, Barney, you know, we have to move beyond making the case for nature-based solutions, and I'm paraphrasing, you know, we, we must listen carefully and respectfully to those who have concerns. And I think, to me, um, a little bit of the spirit of this uh, session has been about that. How do we do that? So the question that I'd love for all of you to to share your thoughts on is, you know, what do you think is the one biggest concern? There's many, but one or which one would you like to highlight that is important? And how can nature-based solutions or the nature-based solutions approach change to adapt to those demands? So there, there's the, what is the big change and what do we do about it? Because I think a lot of what we have to do about it is probably a bit structural in some cases, right? Whether it is in the context of finance, engagement with the IPLC, et cetera. So maybe this is a topic for a bigger discussion, but if we have to bring it down to a nutshell, I'd love for you to share your thoughts with the audience. I wonder if, uh, yeah? Thank you, <laughs> Virginia, for taking the first one. one. Let's go, yeah. yeah, let's go Virginia, Valeria, and then we move all the way back. Thank you. You'd go a long way to solving the problem if we were talking about real zero and not net zero. And so the, all the fear around <coughs> using nature-based solutions to offset fossil f ongoing fossil fuel production would be alleviated if we actually had separate targets for land, forest and ecosystems and fossil fuels and they weren't treated as fungible. So that's a radical suggestion, but it would go a very long way to fixing the problem. The other is to have some concrete examples where rights plus resources to Indigenous people were properly recognised and funded. So I think they're my two take-homes for fixing the problem. <laughs> I think that's a very interesting and tough question because there are a lot of elements and things to be considered into account. But in a general matter, I think that it's important to 
to enhance and to ensure that there is like inter-institutional and uh, communication with other organizations, other main actors, to ensure that they are under that we have the same understanding of what are nature-based solutions. Why can they uh, help us to to have like a a big and important but also resilient um, um, response to climate change, and to also enhance and ensure their participation because sometimes. There are like so many efforts, so many ideas, but we don't have the right channels. We are not understanding the same problem, the same target. So it's important for us to to communicate that, to see like we can collaborate and to to avoid like a personal or a little interest, just to see that it's a it's a solution for all. I mean, we are having uh, the nature, we have a, like a kind of communication with nature. It, it, it's offering us uh, different perspectives, different options. So we, we need to to guarantee that there is communication and a um, common understanding of that to, to get it. Thank you very much both. And uh, we'll have to be very brief uh, because of the new session is coming soon. Thank you. Thanks, I'll be very brief. I just want to highlight access to climate finance. Um, Nature-based solutions, they fall within the same space of adaptation and um, ecosystem-based approaches, uh, resilience building. Um, and like these approaches, um, the nature-based solutions are also not necessarily cost-effective. So we talk about cost-effective solutions, we talk about um, you know, investments, but they are not necessarily projects and initiatives that are going to generate revenues which sort of attract <coughs> private sector financing. They are not necessarily bankable solutions. So, you know, given that reality, how can developing countries still access finance from public and private sources, including philanthropy and uh, institutional investors? Thank you. Uh, I think probably just two points. One is uh, by listening to what the uh, uh, criticisms or, or concerns are. Uh, I, I emphasize that again. Um, I think that's really important and not to not not to assume that any criticisms are, are, are in in sense must must be motivated by um, you know ulterior motives. so uh, I think we have to take them seriously. and I think we have to be prepared to get into the the nitty gritty the the, the, the detail, you know, what are the precise institutional, regulatory, legal arrangements that we have for um, uh, implementing nature-based solutions? Um, in, in the nicest possible way, we have to be prepared to get our um, uh, hands dirty in the, in, in the, in, in, into these kind of fo po policy and political discussions. You know, and rep re recognize that what we're talking about is a redistribution of resources in order to achieve certain objectives. And that, that's, that's politics. And, 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 and we have to um, uh, get into that and, uh, and address the concerns. Thanks all very much. And thank you, Bar uh, um, Sandeep. Over to you for a final word, uh, just to farewell. No, thank, thanks, Dan. And I have nothing further to add. I think we have heard it all from our, you know, very uh, <laughs> eminent panelists. So all that remains for me to do is to uh, ask you all to join me in, in expressing our thanks to all the panelists. Uh, so let me... And... Uh, Indeed, I'd like to express our thanks to the audience as well. You've heard about nature-based solutions. Hopefully, you'll go away from the session better informed. So thank you very much once again for being part of this event today. Thank you. And after all that, I certainly don't want to walk away with these two <laughs> copies of this wonderful report. Oh, could nice I have one, please? <laughs> well, we don't even have to do that. Uh, I'd like one. Could we end it? No. Yeah, I need to. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. they can have one. Thank you. That's for her, but if you want to have another, that will be perfect. Are you okay. okay with that? Yeah, 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 you take it. Huh? I can get one.